Come here, said his father. Patrick stepped closer. Shall I pick you up by the ears? No, shouted Patrick. It was the sort of game they played. His father reached out and clasped Patrick's ears between his forefingers and thumbs. Patrick put his hands around his father's wrist, and his father pretended to pick him up by the ears, but Patrick really took the strain with his arms. His father stood up and lifted Patrick until their eyes were level. Let go with your hands, he said. No, shouted Patrick. Let go, and I'll drop you at the same time, said his father, persuasively. Patrick released his father's wrist, but his father continued to pinch his ears. For a moment, the whole weight of his body was supported by his ears. He quickly caught his father's wrists again. Ouch, he said. You said you were going to drop me. Please, let go of my ears. His father still held him, dangling in the air. You've learned something very useful today, he said. Always think for yourself. Never let other people make important decisions for you. Please let go, said Patrick, please. He felt that he was going to cry, but he pushed back his sense of desperation. His arms were exhausted, but if he relaxed them, he felt as if his ears were going to be torn off, like the gold foil from a pot of cream, just ripped off from the side of his head. You said, he yelled, you said. His father dropped him. Don't whimper, he said in a bored voice. It's very unattractive. He sat down at the piano and started playing the march again, but Patrick did not glance. He ran from the room, through the hall, out of the kitchen, over the terrace, along the olive grove and into the pine wood. He found the thorn bush, ducked underneath it and slid down a small slope into his most secret hiding place, under a canopy of bushes wedged up against a pine tree which was surrounded by thickets on every side. He sat down and tried to stop the sobs, like hiccups, that snarled his throat. Why did his father do that? Nobody should do that to anybody else, he thought. In winter, when there was ice on the puddles, you could see the bubbles trapped underneath, and the air couldn't breathe. It had been ducked by the ice and held under, and he hated that because it was so unfair, and so he always smashed the ice to let the air go free. Nobody can find me here, he thought. And then he thought, what if nobody can find me here? Yeah. I, I think it's, um, I hope it's very clear. I, he, yeah. he first of all triumphs in the idea of being in a secure hiding place. Right. And then in a deeper sense, he feels that no one will ever really understand right. his experience. Right. Um, so the... Um, it's really only, you know, it's delightful to hide if you think you're going mm. to be found, mm. but if you think you're never going to be found and mm. never recognized, it's actually a fresh source of anguish mm. beyond the initial anguish which makes mm. you want to hide. Mm. So he, he falls, you know, he mm. falls through the false security of mm. having found somewhere to hide. Mm. Um, Yes, I mean, the homelessness is very literal uh, mm. in, this, uh, in this novel, in that it's, it's about the loss of this mm. uh, house at one level that, mm. uh, that has been a kind of massive um, consolation mm. for Patrick. And mm. during, during his childhood, he's... Mm. he's sort of populated the, the, all his surroundings with magical thinking. Mm -hmm. He feels when he's raped by his father that a, a gecko has, has taken some custody of some essential part of him and, mm -hmm. and run away and saved him from being utterly destroyed. Mm -hmm. He has all these secret hiding places. The whole landscape has mm -hmm. been made mm -hmm. magical. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he gets from his surroundings and from the animals um, around him the kind of comfort or a substitute for the kind of comfort that uh, children would normally get from their parents if their parents were, were civilized. Mm -hmm. And that's to some extent the... Um, 
the subject after the house has been lost. I don't want to give anything away, but no. <laughs> um, in the fourth book, which you may not have read, um, uh, the, the house gets lost. And in the fifth book, he's reflecting on what it's meant to him. And this is just one paragraph um, looking back towards the end on the property where he was hiding and investing so much emotion when he was a child. Eleanor's his mother. Eleanor had given San Azar away, but at least she had provided it in the first place, if only as a massive substitute for herself, a motherland that was there to cover for her incapacities. In a sense, its loveliness was a decoy, the branches of almond blossoms reaching into the cloudless sky, the unopened irises like paintbrushes dipped in blue the clear amber resin bleeding from the gunmetal bark of the cherry trees. All that was a decoy. He must stop thinking about it. A child's need for protection would have assembled a system out of whatever materials came to hand, however ritual or bizarre. It might have been a spider in a broom cupboard, or the appearance of a neighbour across the well in a block of flats, or the number of red cars between the front door and the school gates, that took on the burden of love and reassurance. In his case, it had been a hillside in France. His home had stretched from the dark pine wood at the top of the slope, all the way to the pale bamboo that grew beside the stream at its foot. In between were terraces where vine shoots burst from twisted stumps that spent the winter looking like rusted iron, and olive trees rushed from green to gray and gray to green, in the combing wind. Halfway down the slope where the cluster was the cluster of houses and cypresses and the network of pools where he'd experienced the most horror and negotiated the most far-fetched reprieves. Even the steep mountainside opposite the house was colonized by his imagination and not only with the army of trees marching across its crest. Later on, its rejection of human encroachment became an image of his own less reliable aloofness. Mm. And that definitely I mean, introduces that constant theme of, of this, the duality by, which, by way of which saint Nazaire is, is the scene in which he, something horrible takes place, it's a traumatic place. At the same time, it's this mag magical sanctuary and true motherland or homeland of, uh, for Patrick. Um, but on that theme Pe of... People will fetishize whatever they have to hand, as he says. Yes, absolutely. The, Had it been some suburb in, in Northern England, yeah. that would have been it, probably. And yeah. a lot of the, these books are about, about substitution, about the way that people substitute one thing for another and then substitute something for, for the, the thing they initially substituted. Right. And all his... his um, addiction and the whole story is a story of of mm -hmm. of substitutory consolations yeah. it, patrick manages not to pass on that chain of endless substitutions to his sons yes he's obsessed uh with with the uh the flow of poison from generation to generation mm -hmm. and and he there are the two obvious things mm -hmm. that um that people do with their children, he manages to to avoid, namely, you know, doing to your children what you hated having done to you, mm. um, or or doing the opposite of what mm. you hated having mm. done to you. You know, hysterically mm. lurching to the other side of the boat mm. Mm. and and capsizing in in mm. another direction. Mm. But he knows that he can't. That at the more subtle level mm. of of the effect that his upbringing is hard on him, his conditioning is hard on him, mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to um, not to affect mm -hmm. your children with the consequences mm -hmm. of your own conditioning. Mm -hmm. However aware mm -hmm. you become, in the end, you're, you're communicating your, mm -hmm. your way of being. Mm -hmm. Not only do they not do what you tell them to, mm -hmm. and do they not do... <laughs> they also um, don't do what you do to some extent, but they, right. they do what you are, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. 
and mm. that uh, is very, very difficult to, mm. um, to overcome. That's an ongoing task, I think, for any parent. Absolutely, Ali, absolutely. Wait, wouldn't you say there's a difference, though, between Robert and, and Thomas in that regard? Robert seems to take it upon himself in particular. There, there is some resonance in, in, the, in the consciousness of Robert. He's extremely sensitive to his father's moods, whereas Thomas uh, is described as being slightly more autonomous in terms of being his own, his own little person. Absolutely. Tom, Thomas uh, is, is, um, is born late enough and mm. is, um, mm. is being sort of adored as by Mary as the last child she's able to have. Mm. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't really buy into his father's unconscious, mm. which is what Robert is doing. Robert mm. is you know, identifying with his father's sense of loss, identifying with his father's sense of betrayal, mm. um, turning against his grandmother. Mm. Um, it's all of that, all, all the tasks that. that Robert yeah. takes it upon himself to perpetuate. Yeah. And, and Patrick feels this mm. terrible conflict. On the one mm. hand, he's rather um, pleased to have converted Robert, to have mm. got him on his side. Mm. And on the other hand, he sees it as a disaster because mm. Robert has been you know, in, infected by this, by this sense of loss. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in some ways, Robert's sense of loss is ordinary. You know, mm -hmm. he, he hasn't, he loves San Azar because it's a beautiful and fascinating place. Yeah. He, he hasn't got, he hasn't fetishized it. He just loves it. Absolutely. So it's a different relationship. Absolutely. And Patrick's the one who's tr in trouble because mm -hmm. he's fetishized it mm -hmm. and loved it and hated it. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. And he feels he's going to lose his sanity mm -hmm. by losing this gigantic, mm -hmm. it's like what Winnicott used, you know, called a transitional object, you know, mm -hmm. the, like a blanket that mm. little children have, you know, mm. as a substitute for their mother. Well, this property is mm. his transitional object mm. that he's never let go of. Right. And he's got to let go of it at 45, which some people say is a bit late in the day. <laughs> but, you know. That's the point of the discussion. Yeah. When, when do we reach that point? When is the appropriate <laughs> moment to let, let go, go of your favourite teddy yeah. bear or blanket? Yeah. But, um, but it's performing that mm. role, mm. that, that, that mm. it's appeasing a, a, mm. a gigantic anxiety. Mm. Um. Absolutely. What about Nancy? That's, that's Eleanor's um, sister. Yes, and she somehow, in, in, in her own peculiar way, she seems to struggle with a related problem. Um, what's, how's, how's Nancy dealing with that problem? He, she's the, uh, the wealthy, oh, not so wealthy, well, she sister can. living she, in, in, in New York. She's very nostalgic America. for her, yeah. her very um, opulent upbringing. Right. But she turns out to be a, a sort of um, impoverished kleptomaniac who, um, <laughs> who, who can't go to lots of incredibly expensive shops in New York. She has a special map of New York because she's, she's taken things, you know, which she was going to pay for later and then <laughs> never given them back and given a full Makes going through town a bit complicated. And, yeah. But she, in her mind, her kleptomania is in complete justified because she's compensating for the mm. the wound of disinheritance mm -hmm. so there's an intergenerational flow of mm -hmm. disinheritance Eleanor's and Nancy's mother uh, married this French Duke and he took all um, her American money mm -hmm. and um, and the daughters are left with what would seem to anyone else perfectly Not enough so to be getting along with you know. <laughs> right. but, but to them is a devastating right. um, uh, wound and a devastating loss. Um, mm -hmm. And Eleanor responds by becoming um, sort of ludicrously spiritual mm -hmm. and pretending she didn't care. She's left the material plane mm -hmm. on which disinheritance takes place altogether mm -hmm. and is only concerned with with cosmic consciousness <laughs> and um, shamanic empowerment and so forth. She mm. leaves the Save the Children Fund mm. to her favorite charity while she's failing to save her children and never mind. Yeah, yeah. Then become the Transpersonal Association. Mm. She's become even more detached from mm. 
uh, reality. Mm. Whereas Nancy takes the other route of being grossly materialistic, mm. grossly acquisitive, mm. grossly nostalgic, mm. and, and feeling so wronged mm. that anything she does to correct the crime that mm. was committed against her is justified, mm. even mm. if it involves, mm. you know, um, <gasps> ripping off shopkeepers and Absolutely. throwing, yeah. you know, um, yeah. getting friends into debt. She doesn't mm. care mm. because she's compensating for an injustice which mm. is, is too great. Mm. So, yes, I mean, in that sense, all the characters, there is a kind of uh, a, a democracy of entrapment mm. in, in these books in that um, everyone is failing to be free mm. in some way. Mm. And some people are grotesquely failing to be free, like Nancy. Um, and some people are struggling um, and making a little bit of progress. Mm. But in one sense, all five of these books are really fueled by that single theme. Mm. Um, how, you know, what would it mean to be free? Absolutely. And how, and how do you go about it? And that's Patrick's mm. obsession. Mm -hmm. And obviously, he's had such an extraordinarily violent and oppressive experience of imprisonment mm -hmm. that he's very motivated to mm -hmm. find the answer mm -hmm. to that. He's been imprisoned by his father's mm -hmm. sadism and um, sexual perversion, mm -hmm. and then imprisoned by his addiction. Mm -hmm. And he emerges from that mm -hmm really motivated to find the answer mm. to that question. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and he makes a little bit of progress in, mm. but it take, it's slow mm. and difficult. Yeah. Slow torture is difficult, really, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to yeah, revert to that theme later on what freedom might mean in these novels. What exactly would be, you know. Well, don't ask me. I don't. <laughs> don't ask me for a definition. For good. No, 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 no. no we can just not. throw the word around. You yeah, know, like American presidents. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Freedom. This is a free country. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. not get too close. Yeah, well, okay, I'll tell you what. I what do I think freedom is? I think. Um, well, you've, I mean, got, the, you've got lots of philosophers in there uh, uh, thinking about freedom. I look, at the most basic right. level, what I think freedom is, um, is uh, being able to dispose of your attention voluntarily. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to think about the thing mm -hmm. you want to think about mm -hmm. and not to be distracted mm -hmm. by obsession mm -hmm. or by um, retrospection or mm -hmm. by, you know, projection. Just to, to be able to place your attention mm. exactly where you choose. Mm. And, I mean, if you think about that, it's quite difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there is this conversation between Johnny Hall <coughs> and Patrick a couple of times on the difference between indifference and detachment, which maybe relates to that. Yes. I remember that vaguely. I mean, M Mikhail, Mikhail's read these books, you know, really carefully and intelligently, very recently. I just wrote them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what goes on. In there. But he said um, <laughs> he did write out a quotation about that. Something. About, oh, here we are. Um, um, I did. Thank goodness. There were passages he copied out for me which I didn't remember at all. I, <laughs> and I, one of them I thought, I thought was quite good. I think. But, um, <laughs> Not bad. But, um, right. but anyway, right. this one is... Um, uh, I can't... I can't imagine any kind of liberation except eventual indifference. This is Patrick speaking. Or detachment, said Johnny. I don't suppose you'll ever be indifferent. Yes, detachment, said Patrick, you didn't mind having his vo who didn't mind having his vocabulary corrected on this occasion. Indifference just sounded cooler. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, and of course, he's never indifferent. <laughs> it, 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 that, you know, Johnny's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Indifference is some kind of mm -hmm. you know, teenage junkie mm -hmm. idea of mm -hmm. what it would mean to be free. Mm -hmm. The cooler stuff. Um, and, and also, there's a debate in some hope about 
forgiveness and, mm. and detachment. Mm. And Patrick comes to the conclusion that there's something slightly patronizing in forgiveness, that, mm. the, that in order to forgive someone, you have to feel morally superior to them. You know, you're, you're forgiving them. Their crime is against you. You're beneficently setting them free. Mm. And so there's that little moral slope Mm. Um, of this slight taint of condescension um, in forgiveness relative to detachment. And detachment would, would be this kind of transparency, uh, this kind of um, ability to place your attention where you choose to. Mm. Uh, and to, if you like, another way of looking at it would be to, you know, to respond to everything but to react to nothing, you know, mm. not to react to things, mm -hmm. but to be free to respond to them. Mm -hmm. Those are very different mm -hmm. forms of mm -hmm. engagement. Mm -hmm. you know. God, I'm coming up with all these definitions of freedom. <laughs> I thought, definitions and distinctions, you know, You can't stop me now, there'll be another <laughs> one. In. So some of the aristocrats in these novels would very much seem to be at home. Um, mm. Um, feeling it very much at home. Sonny Graves then st certainly seems to be, you know, manor, master of the house, master of the manor. Mm. It very much seems to be at home at Cheatley. And yet, when Princess Margaret arrives, he is suddenly maybe not as detached as, as he ideally might have been. Mm. No, uh, yes, Sonny has that... Um he has a sort of hereditary complacency, you know, he, he, he's, um, he's born into a position. So the whole problem of, of self-knowledge is, is um, circumvented to some extent, you know. Um, which, which has, you know, it has its conveniences, it also has its disadvantages. I mean, he's a boring mm. ass, you know. He's <laughs> <laughs> also fairly bigoted, I mean. The, he's bigoted, I he's, mean, he's boring, he's pompous, <laughs> you know, his wife leaves him. Um, absolutely. He messes up the dinner with Princess Margaret. You know, right. it's, not, right. it's not great being right. sunny, but superficially right. it looks good because... Right. Because of that, that mm. all the rest of us who, mm. who, who aren't born into a position mm. where our life is defined by, mm. Um, mm. by our social coordinates, mm. um, you know, go around wondering what life's for and who we are and mm. so forth. And to mm. some extent, mm. those, he's been given a provisional answer to those questions. Mm. Mm. But it's not that easy, mm. you know. Um, I mean... Life would be very dull if it He's was... He's got his problem, um, and he needs a male heir, for instance. Uh, he, needs, he needs a son yeah. to pass along cheaply. Mm. That causes problems as well. Um, but in general, I mean, yes, absolutely. So homelessness and trying to find a home is certainly something that runs through all of these novels. I thought we might um, move on to the... Um, to the topic of irony. I mean, these are... I mean, in some sense, these are tragical novels. This is, this is a tragedy. Something horrible happens to Patrick. Mm. At the same time, these are incredibly funny, witty, and amusing novels. Mm. I mean, you, know, you find yourself laughing all the time, laughing <laughs> so many times during these novels, which is really quite odd. Mm. In Denmark, a couple of years ago, um, a fairly well-known author published a book um, about his childhood in which it uh, suffered horrible abuse. It's a very, very serious book. There is no humor in that book whatsoever. Mm. So I thought it might be interesting to, to just briefly touch on the, 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 these different kinds of humor. We've got irony, we've got satire, you've got wit. And maybe move on to the, to the topic of irony. And how mm. irony plays into, um, is, is part of uh, the sense in which these books are, are very, very funny and sometimes extremely sad as well. Mm. Um, and, and this is uh, related to um, to another passage you might, I don't, I'm not sure if you want to read it now. Sure, um, I don't mind. We'll, I, we'll wait it, later. Um, I'm thinking I mean, about the, some hope, the, I mean the, page four. Oh, page four. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think, I think that um, um, the passage I will read in a moment on, <laughs> on page four is... Um, <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> no, no, but I, I, I agree. I, we, we should definitely read that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it shows, if you like, the, the, the pathological origins of, mm -hmm. um, 
of uh, Patrick's relationship with, mm. with irony, um, which is again taken up in, in, in at last. He says irony is the hardest addiction of all to give mm. up mm. because it's that desire to be in two places at the same time. Mm. Because when you're being ironic, you're saying one thing and meaning another or meaning several other things. Mm. And that, that, that business of hedging your bets is mm. something that goes very, very deep mm. in his psyche. Mm. So it's, it's, it's pathologically rooted, but it mm. generates um, some humor. Mm. This is a very short <laughs> passage you'll be relieved to hear. Um, he was worn out by his lifelong need to be in two places at once, in his body and out of his body, on the bed and on the curtain pole, in the vein and in the barrel, one eye behind the eye patch and one eye looking at the eye patch, trying to stop observing by becoming unconscious and then forced to observe the fringes of unconsciousness and make darkness visible, cancelling every effort but spoiling apathy with restlessness, drawn to puns but rebelled by the virus of ambiguity, inclined to divide sentences in half, pivoting them on the qualification of a but, but longing to unwind his coiled tongue like a gecko's and catch a distant fly with unwavering skill, desperate to escape the self-subversion of irony and say what he really meant, but really meaning what only irony could convey. Um, so I think that uh, to some extent, if you like at a rhetorical level, mm -hmm. um, this, these books are about this man who's addicted to irony in a very profound way because mm -hmm. of these psychological reasons mm -hmm. um, and who gradually is moving mm -hmm. towards being able to mean one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then at mm. last, mm. He, he reaches the point where he can, um, mm. he can mean what he says and say what he means. Mm. And that doesn't mean that irony is banished, mm. irony, but irony is optional. Mm. It's, not, it's not unavoidable. Not everything needs to be ironized. Right. You know? Some things can be ju said just as they are. Right. You know? And he, he achieves that capacity um, you know in the last book and that's the, mm. uh, the the rhetorical version of his progress towards a certain kind of freedom mm. and in turn it, it, it touches on the whole question of of inarticulacy you know mm. um, of the, of something um, that uh, that is too awful to mm -hmm. speak of. Mm -hmm. um, in never mind, the taboo of the rape becomes deeply buried in him. Mm -hmm. he, he confesses it to his friend Johnny in the third mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. But there turns out to be an even deeper mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. of inarticulacy in mm -hmm. him, which, which emerges when he goes into the maternal realm in the last mm -hmm. two books. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, Mother's Milk deals with inarticulacy in a very literal way. Mm. There's a, a, Eleanor's become senile mm. and she's lost the ability to speak. Mm. Um, and Thomas has just been born mm. and doesn't yet have the ability to speak. Mm. So one of the central subjects of, of Mother's Milk is what kind of consciousness do you have without words? Mm. Um, and Patrick is observing this coolly as someone who's a master of words and is, mm. you know, has all sorts of theories about what mm. kind of consciousness you might have mm. without words. But in at last, he's plunged mm. into his own inarticulacy, mm. uh, the fact that he, he, um, he has a core mm. uh, in him of something that's never been expressed. And until he confronts that, mm. he can't abandon irony. Mm. So in a way, there's a kind of rhetorical or linguistic reflection of mm. what's going on emotionally mm. taking place in, in following, tracking the question mm. of irony or inarticulacy in these mm. books. But there's another kind of, of humour at work here as well, which is fairly important, I think, especially in, 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 in some hope, but also in some of the other books, uh, namely satire. Mm. Um, 
Patrick is being extremely satirical, and, and Nicholas Pratt, one of my favorite minor characters, is also being extremely satirical. I mean, you've, you've definitely got the issue of satire. Um, yes. And, and what, what kind of work does that yield in these novels? Well, I mean, the, the novels... I mean, to take a step back, I agree with you that, that, that basically the core of the novels are tragic and mm. often the mm. surface is mm. hilarious. And then I think in At Last something happens that takes you beyond tragedy and, and mm. comedy, and it, mm. uh, but right at the end, which we're not going to spoil by reading. Um, but, the, um, but in the meantime, yes, there's satire. Um, uh, the... Um, I suppose, I suppose, I mean, speaking personally, I, d I just see the world as, um, as, you know, heartbreaking and ridiculous at the same time. I can't seem to separate the two, you know. I can't, if I were French, I'd tidy it up. I'd have, you know, Molière taking care of the comedy and Racine taking care of it. Right. But, we, but it's all muddled up for the English. Right. Um, and um, we come from this, this uh, different tradition, I think, where, where formality is, is less tidy. And I just, um, so it has, m it has many aspects, um, mm -hmm. because I think that, that whether something is tragic or, or comic is a function of the distance from mm -hmm. which it's seen. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you have multiple points of view, mm -hmm. you, have, you, you inevitably have people who are, who are bringing in satirical as well as... Mm -hmm. um, heartbreaking perspectives. Mm. I mean, there are, yes, I mean, Nicholas Pratt, we could do something spontaneous. I haven't... Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I haven't... He wants some Nicholas Pratt. Uh, Nicholas Pratt, yeah. Okay. Let's to Nicholas Pratt. Gonna, that would be great. Okay. Well, this is so unplanned. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, <laughs> I don't normally do this. I mean, I haven't practiced this. I'll probably... Mess it up, but I have a feeling <laughs> that he comes yeah, into chapter eight if I can find chapter eight. And somehow, <clears throat> um, Princess Margaret is the um, key guest at uh, this house party um, that that Sonny Gravesend is is giving, and Nicholas Pratt is part of the inner circle. Ooh. I'm going to read this. I don't know when I'm going to stop, so it's because it's <laughs> I'll stop um, you. I'll stop yeah, you. just hit me on the head. <laughs> absolutely. Um, actually, I sort of, I think I, actually, I've got an idea. Where I'll, I'll stop there. Um, <laughs> Sonny's inner circle, the 40 guests who were dining at Cheatley before the party, hung about in the yellow room, unable to sit down before Princess Margaret chose to. Do you believe in God, Nicholas? asked Bridget, introducing Nicholas Pratt into the conversation she was having with Princess Margaret. Nicholas rolled his eyeballs wearily, as if someone had tried to revive a tired old piece of scandal. What intrigues me, my dear, is whether he still believes in us, or have we given the supreme schoolmaster a nervous breakdown? In any case, I think... It was one of the Bibescos who said, to a man of the world, the universe is a suburb. <laughs> I don't like the sound of your friend Bibesco, said Princess <laughs> Margaret, wrinkling mm. her nose. How can the universe be a suburb? It's too silly. <laughs> what I think he meant, ma'am, replied Nicholas, is that sometimes the largest questions are the most trivial because they cannot be answered, while the seemingly trivial ones, like where one sits at dinner, he gave this example while raising his eyebrows at Bridget, are the most fascinating. Aren't people funny? I don't find where one sits at dinner fascinating at all, lied the princess. <laughs> Besides, as you know, she went on, my sister is the head of the Church of England, and I don't like listening to atheistic views. People think they're being so clever, but it just shows a lack of humility. <laughs> Silencing Nicholas and Bridget with her disapproval, the princess took a gulp from her glass of whiskey. Apparently, it's on the increase, she said enigmatically. <laughs> What is, ma'am, said Nicholas, child abuse. 
said the princess. <laughs> I was at a concert for the NSPCC last mm. weekend, and they told me it's on the increase. <laughs> Perhaps it's just that people are more inclined to wash their dirty linen in public nowadays, said Nicholas. Frankly, I find that tendency much more worrying than all this fuss about child abuse. Children <laughs> probably didn't realize they were being abused until they had to watch it on television every night. <laughs> I believe in America they've started suing their parents for bringing them up badly. Really? Giggled the princess. I must tell mummy, she'll be fascinated. <laughs> Nicholas oh, burst out laughing, but seriously, ma'am, the thing that worries me isn't all this child abuse, but the appalling way that people spoil their children these days. <laughs> isn't it dreadful? gasped the princess. I see more and more children with absolutely no discipline. <laughs> It's frightening, <laughs> terrifying, Nicholas confirmed. But I don't think that the NSPCC were talking about our world, said the princess, <laughs> generously extending to Nicholas the circle of light that radiated from her presence. <laughs> what it really shows is oh, the God. emptiness of the socialist dream. They thought that every problem could be solved by throwing money at it, but it simply isn't true. People may have been poor, but they were happy because they lived in real communities. My mother says that when she visited the East End during the Blitz, she met more people there with real dignity than you could hope to find in the entire corps diplomatique. <laughs> That's a very long reading, but hilarious. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. I mean, that was, was incredibly funny. And a very good example of, of the kind of uh, role satire plays <laughs> in this novels as well. Yes. Incredibly, incredibly funny. And I think very fascinating to many Danes because, um, I mean, in, in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, we have, a we have this huge amorphous middle class. We don't really have an aristocracy in, in the sense that you have. Poor you. Oh. Sorry? <laughs> How do you cope? <laughs> As you can see, it's That's a, a good huge question. loss. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is uh, <laughs> incredibly funny. And also, you know, it turns on, reveals some of the Britishness of this fiction, I think. You would never get this kind of fiction from any Danish author. I think it's just too impossible, because there would be no material. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a good quote from, from Eleanor on a, on a slightly more serious note on, on this you know, wonderful topic of satire. Uh, never mind, chapter 11. American, of course, is American and arrived uh, to England and all of that. Mm. And, and it goes like this. It's a very brief one, so I'll just read it. Mm -hmm. um, and it just says, Eleanor still found it inexplicable that the best English manners contain such a high proportion of outright rudeness and gladiatorial combat. Yes. So what's... What's with I those think, manners? I think, I think so polite that's, and have good, great manners. Yeah, I think that's on the decline. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but it's still very visible relative to other countries. And I think what it right. is is, is that um, in England, because there's, uh, there's been in the past, and there continues to be to some extent, um, such a discouragement of the free expression of emotion and mm -hmm. affection and so mm -hmm. forth. There's, it's very awkward if you're not allowed to say, you know, I love you or I like you or something. Mm -hmm. So the way the English show that mm -hmm. they like each other is by being incredibly rude um, <laughs> to someone. And then if that other person doesn't punch them or leave the house or something, it shows that they're really good friends. Um, and, and then... Um, but, you know, there are more direct... You could just say... I think people are catching on. They could just say, I really like you or something. Oh. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's taken a while, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. To crack that code, right. yeah. I mean, being Danish, I've often felt that you're completely confused in the UK. I mean, completely... Like, like ben you all me. say you love each other all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, well, not really. I mean, we're just very... I mean, I think we're very direct... Um, Good. And very rude that. sometimes, but in a different way, just very blunt. No, it's this perpetual oh. rudeness, this rudeness right. as a form of familiarity and affection. And a, right. You know, it's completely bizarre <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and very unpleasant. Right. Uh, I, 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 um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. But there is a great thing about bantering. I've really been fascinated by bantering. There's a lot of bantering going on. It's mm. not necessarily vicious or nasty. 
Yes, I think um, that's, that's probably um, a strong English tradition, perhaps because of, I, I mean, <coughs> This is fancy. I'm making this up as I go along. But perhaps because, but if you look at Parliament as the Prime Minister's questioning time, mm -hmm. it's um, every. It used to be Thursday. I think it's now Wednesday. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition um, have this gladiatorial contest, mm -hmm. and they and um, they. It's a verbal war between mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And it's all about point scoring. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you, you, the Prime Minister goes to the dispatch box. If the leader of the opposition stands up, he has to sit down. The leader of the opposition scores a point. The Prime Minister comes back <laughs> like, over back Trump's. Right. And, yeah. and so the, the whole idea of, um, of debating skills mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of, of being able to go one better or mm -hmm. to come up with a quick response or mm -hmm. so forth is it's enshrined right at the top of, mm. of the system mm. through which we run the country. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, so oratory um, mm. is, is there very mm. visibly at the top. Mm. Whereas when you see these, I mean, they're completely adversarial. The parliament mm. is, is, you know, the government and everyone against the government, mm. like that. When you see these lovely horseshoe parliaments that mm. people, you know, mm. to which are spectrums mm. and mm. they have, you know, the Danish version, the Danish yeah. Oh, right, you have, sorry, I don't you know. <laughs> Maybe, you know. But, but you know, when I see those on television, mm. there's someone talking and, and there's no one in the room or, the, or there's... <laughs> Or they're asleep. <laughs> true enough, true enough. Uh, uh, and, you know, or they're listening right. politely. Right. It's a nightmare. And they, um, what you right. want is, you know, mm -hmm. some I think actually picking up on that in the English man. Parliament. Yeah. They're, they're, they're looking to get some of the drama from the English Parliament these days. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Put, <laughs> put them opposite each other, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. being rude. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that is a, uh, an Rude arena in which witty, rudeness is, uh, is justified. Yeah. It may be leads on to another topic. I was, we talked about it the first time I met you. Um, namely, I was, I, was, I was trying to get you to say something about politics. Uh, we've just spoken about parliaments. And in, in a very obvious way, these novels are not political. I mean, mm. they're about Patrick Melrose mm. and his particular, I mean, challenges and, and his way path through life and all of that. Uh, we've been talking about that. But at the same time, um, there, there are many, I mean, there seems to be an undercurrent, a very, very discreet and very subtle form of undercurrent touching somehow with gloves on, on vaguely political issues. Sure. So for instance, I mean, there, there is, I mean, we talked about maybe the possibility of you reading a very a brief passage, uh, Johnny, on Marxism. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. The, the, no, I think... I mean, it is there. There's no doubt about it. I mean, mm. it did some. It, mm. th there is a critique mm. of, but it's very much. I mean, as it should be in a novel, um, it's mm. intertwined with mm. the action and with the thoughts of the character. It's not, you know, not there, a, there aren't propaganda. any kind of manifesto statements. Absolutely. But but it's there throughout um, the the books, and in in a sense. Another way of looking at what these books are about, of what the primary crime mm. um, of, of David Melrose against his son is an abuse of power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the books are about the abuse of power and mm. that radiates to, mm. to lots of different levels of mm. discussion. Mm. Um, but w without any manifestos. Mm. But of course that is a political issue. It's inherently political. Mm. Um, with a, a small p. Um, it takes about a hundred of these ghosts to precipitate one flickering and disreputable sense of identity, said Patrick. These are the sort of people who were around during my childhood, hard, dull people who seemed quite sophisticated but were in fact as ignorant as swans. Mm. They're the last Marxists, said Johnny, unexpectedly. <laughs> The last people who believe that class is a total explanation. Long after that doctrine has been abandoned in Moscow and Peking, it will continue to flourish under the Marquis of England. 
Although most of them have the courage of a half-eaten worm, he continued warming to his theme, and the intellectual vigour of dead sheep, they are the true heirs to Marx and Lenin. You'd better go and tell them, said Patrick. I think most of them are expecting to inherit a bit of Gloucestershire instead. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was really incredibly funny. Actually, again, (coughs) this is so off-piste. Mikhail doesn't even know I might do this. Actually, I'm not going to do it. I can't (laughs) find it. Um, But there is another, just I do think, very important passage Mm -hmm. in this book. In, at, well, last. at last, yeah, I think about last. A tiny little thing I'm going to. 116, re- maybe. Read to you. No, no, no. Right. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's thinking. I'm not going to go too much into the background of. of uh, um, Patrick was. Cons- <clears throat> um, as far as Patrick was concerned, the past was a corpse waiting to be cremated. And although his wish was about to be granted in the most literal fashion, in a furnace only a few yards from where he was standing, another kind of fire was needed to incinerate the attitudes which haunted Nancy. The psychological impact of inherited wealth, the raging desire to get rid of it, and the raging desire to hang on to it, the demoralizing effect of already having what everyone else was sacrificing their precious lives to acquire the more or less secret superiority and the more or less secret shame of being rich, generating their characteristic disguises, the philanthropy solution, the alcoholic solution, the mask of eccentricity, the search for salvation in perfect taste, the defeated, the idle and the frivolous, and their opponents, the standard bearers, all living in a world that the dense glitter of alternatives made it hard for love and work to penetrate. Mm. Um, so, so that's a, a slightly different level of it, the mm. question of money, mm. which I think is, um, is very dominant at the moment, you mm. know, with the... With the Growing inequality in, mm, exactly. you know, in America and exactly. in England. I don't know about whether here you right. have the same thing, but there are it's, just it's, it's, it's the, on its way. It's on the its rich way. getting richer and the, yeah, absolutely. And the people poor working getting on it. poorer <laughs> yeah. and people right. being stuck getting nowhere. Yeah. And, um, and this kind of strange tribe of rootless, mm-hmm. um, super rich, mm-hmm. you know, stateless plutocrats who, mm-hmm. who seem to be. Uh, running, running the world, mm-hmm. and who, mm-hmm. who think that everything can be monetarized, you know, mm-hmm. that the death of nature mm-hmm. can be turned into a carbon tax, mm-hmm. you know, that everything uh, can be reduced to money, which mm-hmm. is repulsive. Mm-hmm. But it's very much what's going on now. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, let's not get too <laughs> political. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But I just wanted to touch, maybe just briefly touch on Patrick when he receives the news that he has actually inherited something after all. His mother does his very, her very best to disinherit him. Yes. But after all, he, he does get receives news and at last that he does inherit something. Little something. <laughs> little something, you might say. Um, and, and there is this description of his mixed feelings and when he leaves the lawyer's office. Mm. And they've told him just how little, how much he's actually inherited. $2.3 million. <laughs> a very, very minor sum uh, to some people, but not to, to Patrick at this point in time. No. Um, and, um, and there's also but there's, but there's this reflection on how random it is. I mean, Patrick feels that it's so random. I mean, he, jo- he comes on his mother's side from one of these sort of mm-hmm. American dynasties. And uh, uh, as you say, although the last two generations have done their best to disinherit the next generation. (laughs) There was this kind of time release Mm -hmm. pocket of money Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. left by a great grandfather or great Mm -hmm. great grandfather, Mm -hmm. you know, which just suddenly pops up Mm -hmm. um, in this strange uh, dynastic um, Mm -hmm. world. But his, you know, the passage I just, it's lucky, I didn't know you were going to ask me about that, but I mean, the passage I just read is the background, I suppose, Mm -hmm. to what he feels about it. He Mm -hmm. feels um, Mm -hmm. uh, that um, it's it's helpful, but he also feels that there's something uh, shameful about Mm -hmm. undeserved Mm -hmm. good fortune. Mm -hmm. Um, And... uh, 
I think it is, it is um, mm -hmm. demoralizing. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my own life, to just to get personal for a mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I inherited some money when I was far too young and I was mm -hmm. a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. And I spent it all on drugs. Mm. I couldn't wait to get rid of it. <laughs> you know, I hated it. I felt ashamed of having it mm. because my sense of my own worth was, was so low mm. that um, the idea of, of, of my sort of financial worth being higher mm. was somehow incongruous and mm. repellent. And mm. so I destroyed that. Mm. Um, whereas every penny I earn from mm -hmm. writing my books mm -hmm. is, um, mm -hmm. has a totally different quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do think that, um, that work is, well, I mean, Freud said it's work and love that keep Absolutely. us sane. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you, you need both. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I discovered work. Um, when, I, <laughs> when, I, when I ran out of money at 20, 28, and it's been the best thing that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. A bit of money can be quite nice sometimes. Uh, but yes, absolutely, there would seem to be those redemptive, liberatory aspects to work, actually having to work, definitely. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we should just briefly talk on identity. It's such a major theme in these works. I mean, um, and what, what goes on in, in the second volume. I'm improvising here. I'm just thinking about Patrick in, in New well. York. Yeah. Um, and and, um, and what, what goes on with Patrick's sense of identity in, in, in the second novel? Oh my God, um, yeah. In New York, he's, he's, he's taken to New York to, he's 22, he's supposed to pick up his father's ashes. Yeah. David is, is finally dead. But some really, crazy stuff is going on in terms of his personality. Yes. And how would you, how would you describe what's going on there? I would say, I, I would say he's, he's in a state of, of um, total civil war. Um, <laughs> half of him is identified as a, as a victim of, mm -hmm. of his father's cruelty. Mm -hmm. And half of him has done this thing which is famous in psychoanalysis, which is to identify with the aggressor, you know, mm -hmm. to, to imitate the person who's hurting you in the hope mm -hmm. of appeasing them. Mm -hmm. So he, he hates being his father's victim, but he also hates being like his father. Mm -hmm. And he has no tools to get out of this trap, mm -hmm. because all the tools he might use, um, contempt, you know, mm -hmm. Loathing. Mm. They're all his father's tools. They're mm. all they're all tainted. Mm. So he's in a very very mm. uh, untenable position, mm. as R. D. Lang, um, mm. you know, urged us to call it. In the mm. in wh wh why do people become schizophrenic? Why mm. do they fragment? Because mm. they're in an untenable position. Mm. Because there's nowhere to go, and they mm. disintegrate under the pressure. Mm. And Patrick is he's like a, you know, a clay pigeon that's just mm. been shot. You mm. know, he just scatters all over the place. Mm. In these fragmentary voices, these mm. compulsory impersonations. Mm. And um, he's filled with other people's words. I mean, Bad News is the most literary of the books mm. in the sense that it's full of explicit allusions to other Absolutely. writers. He's got, he's got other people's words tumbling through in the whole time. Mm. Beckett and, and, and Tennyson and Juno Barnes mm. and Joyce and, mm. you know, all of these and, and Camus and Conrad mm. and mm. so forth. He, ha he can speak in any voice except his own voice. Mm. Um, and he, uh, he's, He's very nearly fully schizophrenic, mm. but it's, it's actually, it's just the, the thing that just, just keeps him from total insanity mm. is the fact that he, he does the impersonations. Mm. Instead, if he were just hearing mm. the voices and he fully believed in them mm. as autonomous, mm. authoritative voices, mm. but because he, they possess him, because, he, because of his own theatricality, mm. if you like, there's just a little margin of creativity. Mm. Um, he has some relationship with them. Mm. He's not just taken over. Mm. 
<laughs> but it's a very close run thing. Mm -hmm. And the middle, originally I was going to write a trilogy, mm -hmm. and the chapter, the voices chapter of Bad News, mm -hmm. is the middle of it's the middle of the middle, it's mm. the middle of the second mm. book. Mm. It's the, so structurally, mm. when it was going to be three books, it's sort mm. of rather spoiled by having mm. five, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was the point of mm. maximum chaos, mm. of mm. maximum confusion mm. and disintegration. Mm. Um, mm. And, uh, uh, well, there it is, I mean. I'm not going to read you. that, that's no. about 30 pages. <laughs> and no, I, I, no, I do no, know all the voices. The I'm reason. the only person who knows what they really sound like. There is a sentence from the very end, thank goodness uh, Patrick survives the ordeal. I mean, he stages all his voices, he comes through that limbo. Yes. And, and uh, there's this wonderful scene at the very end of, of um, Bad News in which he leaves the hotel that obscenely expensive hotel, mm. and heads back for England, and forgets his father's, uh, the box with his father's ashes. Yeah. And then it, and it goes like this, uh, how could he have forgotten the box? No need to call Vienna for an interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, so yeah. there's this, this constant recurrence of psychoanalysis, um, and um, what, what's going on with psychoanalysis? You refer to Freud, Melanie Klein, transitional objects, R.D. Lane, um, to my mind, as a reader, I mean, I get this impression that, on the one hand, psychoanalysis is summoned all the time. Mm. Uh, it's, it's referred to, it's summoned, it's, it's called up onto the stage. At the same time, it's often taunted and ridiculed and put back. I don't think, I don't think psychoanalysis is particularly, right. I mean, Johnny becomes a mm. he becomes an a therapist, analyst, of course. Yeah, he becomes a psychotherapist. Right. And, and Johnny's definitely a, a, he's, he's a beneficent a figure. Absolutely. Um, and he's always, you know, he's one, he's one step ahead of Patrick in, mm. in, in his sort of evolution, his mm. understanding of things. Mm. Um, but, but it's not brought on very explicitly in the sense that, you know, I, just, I, I decided I wouldn't write a novel in which Patrick went to, you know, uh, 7,000 analytic <laughs> sessions which were <laughs> carefully transcribed <laughs> for my fascinated Risky reader. Risky business. It's <laughs> just, uh, I, uh, you know, but it's alluded to, mm. but I don't, mm. I mean, these books don't in any way endorse a solution, and I think that's um, mm. important. Mm. Uh, it's important for them to be, mm. of, you know, accessible to everyone and to be, you know, neutral in mm. the sense that the only thing they're really endorsing mm. is telling the truth, mm. you know, and I can't very well avoid endorsing <laughs> that, you know, um, <laughs> having spent 22 years writing that, but, you know. Absolutely. Um, uh. but, but they're not saying this is how you tell the truth or this mm. is the kind of truth mm. you have to tell. Mm. Um, Except for Seamus, Seamus and the ridiculous people from, well, Shame, I, from uh, that sect. Mocking things is another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not endorsing. You know. I'm mm. not. I'm not. Um, mm. There's no product placement in this. Novel, <laughs> no, uh, and, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I. I agree mm. with you that the. Um, the pressure of a psychoanalytic um, mm. worldview is probably mm. there. Mm. I hope not. I mean, it's there for people, but lots of in things. In a good way. In a so many way. things Absolutely. are there for people. Absolutely. You can read oh. these books totally straightforwardly as entertainment, or you can pick up anything. Absolutely. Any number of things. Mm. I mean, that's what a reading is. Reading mm. is a collaboration between the writer and the reader. Everyone mm. in this room mm. um, has a different frame of reference, a different mm. experience of life. Mm. And anything they read will land in a different mind and a different mm. imagination. Mm. And they will build a slightly different book mm. for themselves. And it's a transaction, you know, mm. between the 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 writer and the reader. Mm. I really believe mm. that that's very important and mm. sort of unique to writing, mm. and mattered to me a lot. Why writing, my reading mattered to me mm. so much. Um, you know, when I was totally isolated throughout mm. my the first 25 years of my mm. life, you know, in which I mm. never told anyone the truth about mm. my childhood. Mm. You know, it was reading which reached me, which mm. made me feel connected with mm. another 
intelligence mm. and another imagination. Mm. And so that arc between the writer and the reader mm. is a, a very um, important thing that I believe in mm. passionately. Mm. So I wouldn't argue with anyone's reading of my mm. books mm. in the sense, you know, they're, 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 making, mm. they're making a version of it in their, right. Own, right. in their own mind. You, for instance, are constantly pointing out references, <laughs> which I, I never meant to put in there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. And I, I, I think I told you this at one point, but reading these books actually forced me to rethink my entire relation to my own mother and my own father and so on. But it was actually quite hard work. Do you want I to lie down? I, I, <laughs> well, I tell, tell us about this. I specifically instructed my mother not to be here tonight. <laughs> I didn't want the burden of my mother. I mean, most people have one no, 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 not at all. Absolutely. 451 <laughs> yeah. readers out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, well, I won't go into that. Absolutely. No, 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 no need to dwell on that. But um, I thought um, one of the fascinating things, one other fascinating things running through these novels concerns the relation between England and America. Um, mm. There are many transatlantic journeys throughout the, uh, the novels. Mm. And there is this interesting exchange of glances, the American glance at England and the English glance at America. Mm. As Eleanor arriving in the UK and there are Englishmen, English people arriving in America. So I thought, I mean, we actually haven't got that much time left. I thought it might be a good idea to, if you read aloud the, uh, the passage from Mother's Milk that we agreed on, um, oh, yeah. which concerns the... Um, <laughs> The rival. Well, you know, I want to yeah, force no, no, you. Yeah, no, it's but. fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think. I mean, I think in 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 simple personal terms, that's just to do with um, the fact that my mother, you know, came on her mother's side from an American family mm. that had a powerful mm. effect on my mm. life, and we were always going to America. But mm. I think in literary terms, it's 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 Henry James, who's the mm. the great. Um, Absolutely. Sort of exemplar of what he called rather possessively um, my transatlantic theme. Mm. You know, well, mm. actually, <laughs> um, <laughs> there are other people. Not any longer. <laughs> Not any longer. No, no, but Not I mean, there are tons of people who, who've, um, <laughs> who've got involved. Um, but, but you're right, it's an Atlantic. Mm. Uh, these books take place in an, in an Atlantic kind of triangle between mm. England, France, and America. Mm. Um, you know, Hawaii doesn't get a look in. Um, <laughs> so, Nigeria. But there it is. You can't do everything. Um, mm. Mm. Like, well, okay, this is a little passage um, where the family in Mother's Milk, without wanting to spoil the plot for you, anyway, they've lost the house in France. And so they... They're going to America in the hope of... That's their first family holiday. All their lives they've been to the same place, San Nazaire, and now they go off to America. And this chapter is told from the point of view of Robert, um, one of the sons, one of Patrick's sons, who is, I think, probably... I don't know, 10, 11, I can't remember. He's that kind of... A, he's, not, he's not yet a teenager, but he's an old child, if you like. Mm. Would America be just like he'd imagined it? Along with the rest of the world, Robert had lived under a reign of American images most of his life. Perhaps the place had already been imagined for him, and he wouldn't be able to see anything at all. The first impression that came his way while the plane was still on the ground at Heathrow was a sense of hysterical softness. The flow of passengers up the aisle was blocked by a red-haired woman sagging at the knees under her own weight. I cannot go there. I cannot get in there, she panted. Linda wants me to sit by the window, but I cannot fit in there. Get in there, Linda, said the enormous father of the family. Dad, said Linda, whose sigh spoke for itself. That, that certainly seemed typical of something that he'd seen before in London's tourist spots. A special kind of tender American obesity, not the hard-won fat of a gourmet or the juggernaut body of a truck driver, but the apprehensive fat of people who had decided to become their own airbag systems. 
in, in a dangerous world. What if their bus was hijacked by a psychopath who hadn't bought any peanuts? Better have some now. If there was going to be a terrorist incident, why go hungry on top of everything else? Eventually, the air... B- Eventually, the airbags dented themselves into their seats. Robert had never seen such vague faces, mere sketches on the immensity of their bodies. Even the father's relatively protuberant features looked like the remnants of a melted candle. As she squeezed into her aisle seat, Mrs. Airbag turned to the long queue of obstructed passengers, a brown smudge of tiredness radiating from her faded hazel eyes. Thank you for your patience, she groaned. It's sweet of her to thank us for something we haven't given her, said Robert's father. (laughs) Perhaps I should thank her for her agility. Robert's mother gave him a warning look. It turned out they were in the row behind the airbags. You're going to have to put the armrest down. <laughs> yeah, sorry, wrong voice. You're going to p- <laughs> you're gonna have to put the armrest down for the takeoff, Linda. Um, Linda's father warned her. Mom and me are sharing these seats, giggled Linda. Our tushes are expanding. <clears throat> <laughs> Robert peeped through the gap in the seats. He couldn't see how they were going to get the armrest down. <laughs> After meeting the airbags, Robert's sense of softness spread everywhere. Even the hardness of some of the faces he saw on the warm and waxy arrival afternoon in the flag-strewn mineral crevasses of midtown Manhattan looked to him like the embittered softness of betrayed children who had been told to expect everything. For those who were prepared to be consoled, there was always something to eat. A pretzel stall, an ice cream cart, a food delivery service, a bowl of nuts on the counter, a snack machine down the corridor. He felt the pressure to drift into the mentality of grazing cattle. Not just ordinary cattle, but industrialized cattle. Neither made to wait, nor allowed to. In the oak bar, he wanted me to go to the oak bar. In the oak bar, Robert saw a row of men as pale and spongy as mushrooms, all standing on the broad stalks of their khaki trousers in front of the cigar cabinet. They seemed to be playing at being men. They sniggered and whispered like schoolboys who were expecting to be caught out, to be made to remove the cushion they had stuffed under their pastel button-down shirts and unpeel the plastic caps they <clears throat> that made them look as if they were already bald. Watching them made Pat Robert feel so grown up. He saw an old, the old lady on the next table drape her powdered lips over the edge of her cocktail glass and suck the pink liquid expertly into her mouth. She looked like a camel trying to hide its braces. In the convex reflection of the black ceramic bowl in the window, he saw people come and go, yellow cabs surge and slip, the spinning wheels of the park carriages approaching until they grew as small as the wheels of a wristwatch and disappeared. Incredible voices. <laughs> Could have come in great actor, I think. Oh, yeah. um, have you ever read these, these passages aloud in America? No. Right. <laughs> 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 You've got the issue of political correctness. I mean, people probably have a heart I attack. Ha- I haven't, no. <laughs> uh, I'd never read that before, actually. No, no, no. I mean, anywhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good. it works well in Denmark, I think. Works well, thank God. I didn't know where you, where right. you stood on American <laughs> I hope there are no Americans in the audience. I, I don't mind. I mean, it's, uh, the, the Americans are better at making fun of themselves than anyone. So, true yeah. enough, true enough. But this is very much Robert's gaze at America and at Americans. Mm. And Robert is an, Im- an immensely intelligent boy. Mm. Uh, which also, I mean, we haven't got much time left actually, but just raise, maybe we could talk a slight briefly about the, the, the role of children as narrators. Because at first in volume one, and at first in, in volume four, first you've got Patrick, and then you've got Robert, mm. and you see the world through their eyes. 
So what's and Thomas as well? Um, and Thomas as well, actually, yeah, the younger brother, um, Robert's younger brother. Um, that's right. Yes, I um, I find it frighteningly easy to slip, <laughs> <laughs> slip into a childhood perspective. Um, I think, yeah, I've always felt very tuned in to um, what children, for obvious reasons, you know, what children are, are, are feeling and thinking, mm -hmm. and always felt very protective towards them, even, you know, at my worst, when I was um, most unhappy and um, sarcastic and, mm -hmm. you know, addicted and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. I always, I always had, um, for some reason, uh, you know, children were exempt, mm -hmm. and I, because I was so mm -hmm. um, on their side. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's, that's why um, uh, it, it comes out in my, in my writing. Mm -hmm. But I decided to, I've, I've, I think the way I've done it is mm -hmm. not to do baby language, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to... Absolutely. I, I think it's very important to distinguish between, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a child perspective which mm -hmm. tries to mm -hmm. tell it like the child would tell it, mm -hmm. which might be sentimental, mm -hmm. cute, cloying, mm -hmm. oppressive, um, restrictive. Mm -hmm. And the narrator, the mm -hmm. narrator who narrates everyone's point mm -hmm. of view, mm -hmm. narrating mm -hmm. the point of view of the child with a stable mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. um, but with, with, of course, always the the, the needle of diction always has to flicker towards the character who is mm. the center of consciousness mm. at the time. You mm. know, people will bring different vocabularies to, mm. to their situation, but mm. still the narration is even-handed. You know, mm. it's, uh, everyone's allowed to be... I think I want everyone to be as intelligent as they can be, mm. you know, because mm. I think that's more interesting mm. for, the, Absolutely. for the reader. Um, I read this discussion that was taking place. You met the readers of The Guardian in, in London at some point, and one right. of the, the people in the audience said, Are, Aren't you, I mean, projecting too adult, let too much of an adult language onto the children? Right. And I, I think that's a very good reply to that reader. Right, it's mm. exactly. Mm. Mm. <laughs> good. I, I hope he's flown all the way here <laughs> to hear my answer formulated over yeah. two years of <laughs> note taking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. What did I say at the time? Well, you, go you, away. Uh, you said something of the sort. Yeah. <laughs> Probably something similar. <laughs> something very really similar. Okay. <laughs> Not being uh, rude, but just very direct, okay. I think. Yeah. Um, we talked about. Um, Maybe um, you ending this session by, by reading aloud from the end of Some Hope. Because you, oh, there, yeah, is this, okay. I mean, there, is, there is this twin set of endings. Because I... Release yeah. and redemption and everything, Volume 3. You get yet another release and redemption and freedom at the end of Volume 5. But in many ways, perhaps, the, the ending it in, in, at, at the end of Volume 3 is, is the most final. And it appears to be the most final, but, um, but yeah. those who haven't read it last should struggle on to the last chapter, because I think the, the real ending, which is the last chapter of it last, is a more profound release. And, but this is, this is Patrick moving from a position of complete imprisonment to the first taste of, of another possibility of mm. not being preoccupied by mm. his past. Mm. And so it's very intense for him. Mm. But then, you know, there's more work to do. Mm. Um, and uh, so I'll just read the end of Some Hope and maybe we can leave it at that. Mm. Um, and you'll have to, yes, I'm not gonna spoil the end of the whole thing by reading at last. I think it will just stop here. Mm. His thin shoes grew wet as he crunched across the field and his feet soon felt cold. But with the compelling and opaque logic of a dream, the lake drew him to its shore. As he stood in front of the reeds which pierced the first few yards of water, shivering and wondering whether to have his last cigarette, he heard the sound of beating wings emerging from the other side of the lake. A pair of swans rose out of the fog, concentrating its whiteness and giving it shape, the clamor of their wings muffled by the falling snow, like white gloves on applauding hands. 
vicious creatures, thought Patrick. The swans, indifferent to his thoughts, flew over fields renewed and silenced by the snow, curved back over the shore of the lake, spread their webbed feet and settled confidently onto the water. Standing in the sodden shoes, Patrick smoked his last cigarette. Despite his tiredness and the absolute stillness of the air, he felt his soul, which he could only characterize as a part of his mind that was not dominated by the need to talk, surging and writhing like a kite longing to be let go. Without thinking about it, he picked up the dead branch at his feet and sent it spinning as far as he could into the dull grey eye of the lake. A faint ripple disturbed the reeds. After their useless journey, the swans drifted majestically back into the fog. Nearer and noisier, a group of gulls circled overhead, their squawks evoking wilder water and wider shores. Patrick flicked his cigarette into the snow, and not quite knowing what had happened, headed back to his car with a strange feeling of elation.